And while everybody else is still getting here, um, we'll talk a little bit about quiz questions and do some practice with hybridization in formal charge. Um, and then we will get into um, resonance structures, which is basically the next sort of, the word evolution is not quite right, but it's the next revision of hybridization was say that you can't just count on, on electron groups necessarily to look entirely at the structure. Um, you also have to look at how you can um, minimize formal charge in, on as many places as possible. So let's start with some quiz questions. Um, good point blank, getting used to OCHEM question, what molecule is the longest carbon chain? That is tricky because there are a lot of molecules that are essentially hundreds of thousands, if not millions of carbons long. Um, and there's not really a, an upper limit to how large a single molecule could be. Um, if you want to talk about what molecule, what, you know, a lot of, a lot of plastics can be considered one big molecule. So in that case, we're talking about a single molecule made up of moles of carbon atoms that is, you know, the size of your head could be considered one molecule. Um, so it'd be tough to say we can't actually take that and figure out exactly where every single bond is in that because the technology we usually use to actually determine where individual atoms are um, is actually based on being able to have a predictable crystal structure and then bounce x-rays off of it to see where the nuclei are. So if you can't, can't have a predictable crystal structure, you can't actually measure what that structure would be. Um, somebody asked about, could we use organic chemistry and material science to beat the efficiency of photosynthesis? And I think we're actually, I didn't actually look at the numbers, but photosynthesis, all things considered, is not a very efficient process. It's kind of what the process that you would expect from something that was developed over millions of years, one tiny advancement at a time. Um, and so there's a lot of, of places where photosynthesis just plain out isn't very efficient or effective. Um, so I think our photovoltaics, if you want to talk about the raw energy, photovoltaics do an okay job. But if you wanted to talk about something that could actually generate electricity, um, I believe that um, our photovoltaics, you know, just commercially available silicon solar cells are actually can actually beat the um, efficiency of photo photosynthesis already. Um, so it just goes to show you that when you actually focus with uh, an intelligent design mindset and some engineering principles, um, nature is not all that hard to beat on the efficiency game. Um, it's just incredible that nature kind of happens on its own without any input from us. That's pretty cool. Um, somebody else asked about plastic. And plastic's actually kind of related to the, the answer for photosynthesis. Um, basically, plastic doesn't biodegrade because it hasn't been around long enough for any, for any organisms to evolve any pathways to digest it. It's big, long carbon chains, but, but our cells and cells in general are very specific about the carbon chains that they are able to break down and digest. They have to have the, um, the linkages have to be shaped just right in just the right position in order for, for any, any bacteria to be able to break it down. Um, and so it's actually looking like, I, I'm, I haven't seen anything this, about this in a while, but I remember reading a story, a story from um, a year or two ago about uh, there are some bacteria actually in Japanese landfills that are actually already adapting to break down and digest certain categories of plastics. Um, and it's happening exactly where we would expect it to happen in a landfill where there's you know, a lot of, of uh, bacterial reproduction and there's a lot of plastic sitting there with nothing to do. Um, also interesting geology and history note that this is, it's actually very, very similar to what happened with trees when trees first developed. I can't remember exactly what the molecule is um, that allows trees to grow so tall. It's not cellulose, but it's something 
similar to cellulose that allows trees to be taller than other plant cells that grow so high vertically. It might be xylem, but I don't remember exactly. Um, but when that, when that was first evolved into tr trees, there was, um, there was no microbes around that were able of digesting that, of actually um, taking that and breaking it down. So for the first million years or so that trees existed, there was no, they didn't rot tree trunks would just lay there, they would, trees would die, they would fall, and they would just sit there um, because nothing could break it down. And so, you know, and that's, that's actually why for a certain, in a certain geological time period, we actually have a ton of petrified wood because it just got laid down and buried by soil and eventually fossilized um, because there was no other way for that to be broken down, for the wood to be broken down. Um, so plastics actually are following a similar pattern that way. Eventually, a microorganism will develop that will be able to break it down, and it will be biodegrade like many other substances. Um, the question is, are we still going to be around, and when, will we have thoroughly thrashed our environment by that point to the point where it's unlivable already? Um, I don't have any great podcasts for chemistry. I don't have time to listen to podcasts anymore. I don't have a commute or anything. And so um, I don't have great chemistry podcasts. I do have good chemistry YouTube channels. Uh, in particular, my favorite one is a guy named uh, Backyard Scientist um, who does fun things like um, he's the one who did the pouring melted salt into water and it blows up the fish tank. He also has one that I saw more recently where he was yeah, blowing um, ring bubbles with propane and then igniting them underwater. Um, because why wouldn't you try and do that if you've got access to high speed cameras and you know a lot of time on your hands. Um, so he's he's really fun backyard scientist and there's also if you're into engineering, especially it's less on the chemistry side. Um, Niall Red is, he's kind of famous among chemists. He's very uh, eccentric and does really weird things. Um, like he, he takes lithium batteries and takes the lithium out of it and turns it into lithium ions and purifies it to the point that it's um, comparable to the lithium somebody could take as an antidepressant um, just for fun, which is, I believe, totally illegal. It's very illegal to uh, to make your own controlled substance of any form or purify something that's a controlled substance. Um, but he also does other random stuff um, that's kind of more chemistry related. But Smarter Every Day is a really cool engineering one um, where he does things like, um, you know, what happens when you hit a golf ball at, with a um, driver moving at 500 miles per hour. Um, and it turns out the golf ball actually holds up okay, but the driver is destroyed. Um, unless you use an old golf ball before their plastics were as supple and um, ideal for golfing as ours are these days. So random stuff like that. Um, there's some really cool engineering ones out there. This guy got his start. You may have seen a video. It was um, big a few years ago about uh, he took a bicycle and he added gears to the handlebars so that when you steered right, the wheel turned left. Um, just as an experiment to see if he could do it. And it took him about six months of, of practicing every day before he could actually ride it because his mind was so hardwired as a kid for, to ride a bike normally. Um, and then once he learned how to do it, he couldn't ride a normal bike because all the unconscious decisions that your brain makes to try and keep you balanced on a bicycle, he had relearned to do backwards. Um, but it was actually a really interesting study on what they call neuroplasticity, which is the ability to, of your brain to switch back and forth between different modes of thinking. Because his son was 10 years old and his son picked up, um, could learn, ride a bike either way. He could jump on the backward bike and be fine, or he could jump on a normal bike and be fine um, because he learned to do both at about the same time. So lots of interesting Interesting things. Yeah, Olivia, it might have been lignin. I think that that's not sounding right. Xylem is just like their the transport proteins and cells, right? Um, yeah, xylem and phloem are, is like a plant's vasculature, but I think lignin gives it structure and allows it to be tall without falling over. 
Yeah, I think I think you're right. And I wanted to say xyl xylem and phloem, but it's been a long time since I've had a bio class and that sounded like made up words. Like, wasn't phloem like something from the 90s, like GAC that, you know, that you could buy on Nickelodeon that had, you know, um, I, I believe that's actually true. It's some sort of weird foam molding thing you could buy. Um, I feel like that's definitely true, phloem. I remember that. It has a, it's like Play-Doh, GAC, and foam pieces put together. Yeah, it's something like that. I absolutely remember Flom. It was a thing. Yeah, how you know you grew up in the 90s, right? Gak and Flom. Um, some other stuff that's a little bit more specific to OCHEM. Why do you have to take this if you're going into a career in medicine? Um, because you need to know how how OCHEM works before you can understand biochem. You need to understand biochem if you're going to be able to understand how pharmaceuticals work. Um, so, you know, you can get by without knowing too much about OCHEM and still do an okay, do okay in biochem, but if you really want to understand why certain compounds work better, even though they look very similar to, to less effective pharmaceuticals, you, you need the OCHEM a little bit. And plus, to be totally honest, traditionally, this was a weed out class. OCHEM was a gatekeeping cat class that made sure that only people that were capable of studying and working in the way that med school wants you to could, could make it to med school, basically. Um, but it is significantly different. Somebody asked me in my Gen Chem class why OCHEM is considered such a hard class, and it's because it, it's because you can't just get by an OCHEM, at least not for a whole year, with just rote memorization. A lot of bio classes in biochem, if you just brute force it and you just memorize everything, you can actually, you can get a really good grade, do well in the class, and probably understand it pretty well. You can't do that in OCHEM. OCHEM requires you to put in a lot of time and effort, but you really have to think about things in a different frame of mind as opposed to just memorizing names and structures. Um, and so that's, that's hard for a lot of people that are used to when a class is hard, the best thing I can do is just make flashcards and memorize things. Um, and that doesn't work in OCHEM, um, which I didn't find, I thought that was easier than biochem in a lot of ways because I hate memorizing things and I refuse on principle to make flashcards even if they are effective. Um, but it means that for me, biochem and molecular bio are harder than OCHEM. Um, but once you get the hang of OCHEM, it's really the same thing over and over again. Um, we're going to start seeing that it's all just about tracking polarity, track, tracking partial charges and resonance structures, and um, you can predict the outcome of any organic reaction just by following those two things, looking for resonance and polarity and electronegativity. Sean, I'm guessing those things are both covered in our first, our first quarter. They are, yeah. We're gonna we're gonna go pretty slow for the first quarter, in terms of we're gonna get some good foundations, um, and we're going to basically take our time getting into all the details of a couple mechanisms in really great depth, and then quarter two and quarter three are a lot of taking those, and we're just gonna start plowing through mechanisms and and functional groups because they're all gonna follow the same pattern once we know what we're looking for with a very few exceptions. Um, so it's, it's gonna feel like we're gonna go slow for the first quarter and then we're gonna start throwing stuff on there but it's gonna be more of the same. I'm gonna have to actually convince you that it's actually a different reaction sometimes um, and that it's only a different reaction because it was discovered by somebody with a different name really. Um, but yes, and actually we're gonna get into those things both of those things today, for that matter. Um, why does milk ha help with uh, spicy food? Um, we're actually gonna talk about this in lab today. Um, milk capsaicin is the molecule responsible for making things taste spicy. It's based, It's really interesting. It's actually, um, it actually binds to the, the receptors in your mouth and your tongue that sense heat um, and actually makes them too effective, too efficient. And so what you're actually tasting when your mouth feels like it's on fire from eating something spicy, it's actually the heat from your own mouth. You're just your body heat that you're feeling. The problem is, is that capsaicin lowers the threshold for those, for those nerve cells in your mouth to send the signal to your brain. 
And so they're firing too much for the amount of heat that your body is making. Um, and so all milk does is milk has a lot of fat to it and, and capsaicin dissolves better in a nonpolar solvent like lipids than it does in water. So you're basically just washing. It's the equivalent of using soap. You could actually probably use soap and it'd be more effective. It would just taste awful. Um, or you could probably gargle with olive oil and it would work even better too. Um, and even more nonpolar uh, lipid would be probably even more effective. Um, interesting, that's the exact same mechanism that mint does, except mint works on the cold receptors in your mouth. So that's why if you drink a glass of ice water after you brush your teeth, it feels like your teeth are going to fall out um, because it's so cold. It's doing the exact same thing that capsaicin does, but backwards. Um, and why do things separate? This is also, we're going to talk about some in lab today, um, because when you have things that are soluble in water and things that are soluble in fat together, the things that are soluble in water tend to move into a, what the water layer and things that are soluble in fat move into the fat layer. Um, and so that's basically when you give anything enough time, if you don't have something to prevent that, like an emulsifier, which like commercial um, salad dressings have an emulsifier, which is why a vinaigrette you buy at the store doesn't separate, but a vinaigrette you make yourself does, um, is because they're using a, a more effective emulsifier to keep them from separating. But that'll happen with almost any food um, that's made of both fats and, and uh, water um, eventually will separate. And lastly, some questions about the actual material. Um, why do we worry about hybridization? Because hybridization is going to, one, is a convenient way to describe what's going on. And two, is related to the second question. Um, carbon tends to form four bonds because it has four valence electrons. So what's the deal with carbocations and carbanions? Um, they will actually have weird hybridization because a carbocation where you have a positive charge on a carbon only carbon only has three bonds and it actually has an empty section of its p orbital which means that empty section can't hybridize so that actually changes the, sh the molecular shape based on the fact that if it's got an empty p orbital it can't be sp3 when you think about it, if you only have three bonds and then you have an empty orbital, you only have three electron groups, right? So the furthest apart they could be would be trigonal planar. Despite the, so you, you won't actually have a pi bond necessarily forming if you have a carbocation, but it'll still have that same trigonal planar shape of a pi bond because you have an unhybridized p orbital that, there that's not mixed in with the others. Um, and carbanions are the exact opposite. Carbanions basically look exactly like a nitrogen with, that has three bonds. A carbanion is just a carbon that has a lone pair that's not part of a bond yet. And so those are sp3 because you still have four electron groups. Um, and so, so hybridization is helpful in understanding why carbocations are trigonal planar and carbanions are tetrahedral. And it has to do with those electron groups and frankly, we talk about it in terms of hybridization a lot of times just because hybridization is fewer syllables, rolls off the tongue. SP3 is easier to say than um, trigonal bipyramidal um, and all those names. Um, but it does wind up showing up. And when we talk about resonance as well, we can actually have things that should have four electron groups behaving like they're SP2 so that that lone pair can actually participate in resonance. Um, so it also allows us to differentiate between some very specific cases. Um, and one example of that we actually saw in the quiz question. Um, if when you look at the quiz question, if we looked at, actually, I'm just going to zoom out and do this, adding some text boxes. Um, if we wanted to look at, let's start at the top here. Um, for most of these, Uh, most of these atoms, actually all of these, we can just look at these in terms of looking at number of electron groups. So if you remember oxygen, remember our frame of reference change 
with OCHEM is that we are um, looking at the number of, assuming everything has eight electrons around it and filling in anything that we can't see with, um, with bonds, we're filling that in with lone pairs. So oxygen has eight electrons, two of which, two pairs of which are participating in this sigma bond and pi bond to the carbonyl here. So the other two pairs of electrons must be lone pairs. So two lone pairs, therefore three electron groups and sp2. Right, and carbon, we're going to follow the exact same thing. The carbon for carbon one, we can see all of the electric, all of the bonds for carbon one. So we've got two sigma bonds to either side, then you've got a sigma and a pi bond to the oxygen. So three electron groups, one pi bond. So it's going to also be sp2. Carbon two only has two other bonds shown. It has no pi bonds shown. That's really going to be the, the key that we're looking for with carbon, right? Is As long as carbon doesn't have a pi bond and it doesn't have a charge, it's always going to be sp3. The tricky one is this nitrogen because so just counting bonds and lone pairs on this nitrogen, we would say, okay, it's got th four electron groups, therefore it's tetrahedral and sp3. Um, and so that's the answer I was actually looking for on the, on the quiz because um, you guys don't know enough uh, unless you looked up the structure, you don't know enough to know that that lone pair, if you have a lone pair that's adjacent to a pi bond, um, in what's called the allylic position, a, allylic, it, we're going to, I'm going to define it again later in a minute, but allylic basically just means um, that it's one atom away from a pi bond. If you have a lone pair, one atom away from a pi bond, it actually, that lone pair actually can participate in resonance and basically spread those electrons out a little bit more. So even though we would look at this nitrogen and counting electron groups, we would say it should be sp3, it should be tetrahedral. When we actually look at this structure, um, it's actually that nitrogen is going to be planar. Uh, and let's see if I do that and look up the structure. So those of you who put sp2, for this, I think there was at least one person who put sp2. Um, I believe I gave you credit or at least half credit um, because that is technically the correct answer. It's just not the answer I was looking for because you shouldn't have known enough to answer that. And the oxygen at the bottom, on the other hand, I think the batteries must be running down in my mouse. It's not working all that well right now. So when we look at this structure, there's that nitrogen that's that's adjacent to the pi bond. We do see, in fact, it stays totally planar. Everything else, so these three atoms wind up being sp2 hybridized, but everything else is going to be tetrahedral. The oxygen here has got two lone pairs, and we can tell because it's not flat with respect to the rest of the atom, the rest of the molecule. Um, this, we've got tetrahedral carbon, tetrahedral carbon, and this nitrogen is not adjacent to a pi bond. It's not adjacent to the pi bond, so as a result, it's not planar. This having this carbon in the way means that it can't share those lone pairs, so it has to be directly adjacent to a pi bond, and we'll go over all that again. Uh, it's one of those things I want you to see multiple times, um, so which is why we're going through it right now. And especially since you guys asked relevant questions to that, um, you guys are moving the right direction in terms of where we're headed with the material. So for practice, while I go get a fresh battery for my mouse, um, 
take caffeine here, try and figure out how many hydrogens go on to each heavy atom. Nothing has a charge on it, so you're just counting bonds. Label all the lone pairs and label all the hybridizations. Go for that, go through that real quick, and then in a minute I'll we'll walk through it and practice it. All right, much better. So if the nitrogen is adjacent to a double bond, then it falls into that category, but like the nitrogen all the way to the top right. Wait, no, I'm sorry. Bottom left, bottom right, <laughs> bottom right. Did that technically not be adjacent to because it's got a double bond coming off of it as well? So we'll talk about the, the rules basically, but it turns out so you can only have one pair of electrons at a time in a pi bond that's, that's part of this resonance. So because it's already got a pi bond attached to that nitrogen, the, the p orbital that's pointed in the right direction is already being used up. So that, uh, that lone pair can't also be a part of resonance because, because of the sh just the shape of the orbitals. And again, we will see this if we look at the structure for caffeine here. This whole section in the middle, basically everything in the middle, even though if we were counting a, the lone pairs, we would expect this nitrogen to be sp3 and same for these other two that are in the ring structure, but because they've got lone pairs that can now, that can now be adjacent and help spread out those electrons with resonance, they wind up, wind up behaving like they're sp2. They wind up with an sp2 hybridization. Um, and so actually everything that either has a pi bond or is um, in this ring structure is um, sp2 the only sp3 atoms are actually the carbons that are hanging off of the ring structure. And I think I may have just locked my cat into a closet when I, when I uh, grabbed a battery. So let me go see what that's all about real quick. She's fine. She's fine. Her, the closet that we keep her toys in is also where we keep the batteries. So she was just feeling like she wants to get a toy out. All right, so by, in terms of just counting electron groups, we would say these nitrogens are sp3, but because of the resonance structures, and again, we'll go over that with more practice later, but for now you can just know because there's a lone pair next to a pi bond, they're actually going to be sp2 hybridized. Um, and all the lone pairs, every nitrogen is going to have one lone pair unless it has a charge and every oxygen is going to have two lone pairs. So the, the lone pair for the nitrogen that has a pi bond already is going to be pointed in this third direction in 120 degrees from the other two bonds. The lone pair for these nitrogens that are that are part of the resonance structures that are sp2 hybridized, their lone pair is actually going to be 
in the shape of a pi of a p orbital instead of being um, shaped as you know that sort of shape that just sort of looks like a balloon pointed out away from everything else they're actually going to be stuck looking like a p orbital um, because it, you have to just like we had our pi bonds had to be shaped like p orbitals in order to make that above and below sh shape that upside down canoe looking shape um, on, on either side of the sigma bond, the lone pairs here have to do the same thing. Um, a quick note about drawing 3D structures on a flat piece of paper. Sorry, were there any questions about the, the caffeine problem before we move on? And again, we'll get more practice with this in a minute. Um, a quick note about um, showing 3D structures. Um, in general, I don't expect you to have much artistic ability, and that's not a dig at you. Just in general, we try not to assume that science students can draw things well, um, because that's frequently the case. So what we do instead if, is to have a set of standardized um ways of drawing something sticking out of the paper or the board towards you or going behind the board in the the screen um anytime you have you a, have a solid wedge that's going to indicate that it's going to be starting the point of that triangle is going to be um represented as being in the plane of the board or your paper and then the the wide end of that wedge is going to be you think of that as moving pointing towards you so if you think of a sigma bond as being sort of the the shape of a straw the wide end of the straw is pointing towards you and the narrow end is um, further away from you so it's indicating that this chlorine is sticking out of the board or i keep saying board the screen at this point um and these dots the dotted wedges um, are made to show the exact opposite so the dots mean that it's moving away from you um, and frequently you will actually see them drawn the other way um, where it looks like the bond is getting smaller as it's moving away from you but it's really it's just whether it's dots or whether it's solid are going to show that 3d structure um, and you will see that We'll get into bicyclic structures. A, a bicyclic structure is exactly what you would sound like. It's a structure that has two cycles in it. Um, a lot of times they're fused together. Usually it means you have your two, your two cycles, your two ring structures, part of are sharing some of the same atoms. So in this case, this example here, you've got a five-sided ring structure. So a pentagon where the point, one of the points of the Pentagon is pointed towards us up above the screen. And the, and it's also got a hexagon, a six sided ring structure simultaneously. So you, what you, you could actually think of it, if you visualize this as being a flat hexagon where you're connecting two points of the hexagon with a carbon atom sticking up across sort of in, we, talk about that as, as being a bridge between the two points of the hexagon um, and what that would look like. I'm going to continuously just have mole view open in this class because it's a lot of times it's easier than switching back and forth with the screen share. Um, so if I drew a bicyclic structure here. So we got that hexagon, that flat hexagon. It's not really flat. Those are all sp3 carbons. And but with the two points of it are being linked by this other carbon or sometimes two carbons. And we look up that structure. It looks a little bit more complicated than a flat hexagon because of all the tetrahedral structure. But you can still if I rotate it right the outside carbons here are that hexagon with that middle carbon bridging the two points there. All right, so it's, we're going to continually have a need to show 3D structure 
because um, we're going to get into reactions that, that preferentially make one version of a molecule over another. And the only way they're different is because of the 3D structure. So we'll get very comfortable with this. Um, with, cyclic, with cyclic structures, you also see what's called the Hayworth projection. You see this a lot in biology as well. Um, where it's where it's drawn as even though it's not going to be flat hexagon, it's drawn as a flat hexagon that we're looking at the side of. Basically, we're looking at this hexagon edge on, and that allows us to show what's above and below um, the ring structure. Um, the Fisher projection is even more commonly used in biochem and biology as a way to draw in, uh, to draw um, sugars mostly. And basically, it's it has a convention can a convention where all of the vertical bonds are represented as um, going. Let's see, vertical bonds are represented as move as being away from you, pointed into the the paper, and the horizontal bonds are pointing out towards you. So, in terms of drawing a um, a tetrahedral structure. So the way that, that I usually draw, that organic chemists will usually draw an or, a tetrahedral structure. You'll have your central atom. You'll draw two bonds that are in the plane of the board. And then you'll have one bond that's going away from the board and one bond coming out of the board. Right, and so if you think about this, it's, it's a lot like drawing a trigonal planar structure where you're gonna have these things about 120 degrees from each other except in one of those directions, you have two things attached, something coming out and something going in. Um, this Fisher projection, on the other hand, basically is a way of drawing it so that if we're representing it with these um, dots and wedges, the vertical bonds are represented as moving away from you. So if you take, take your, your hand, make an L with it, your thumb and your forefinger both moving towards or into the board and the horizontal bonds are pointing towards you. And so if you have your, your right hand pointing into the board and take your left hand and point in the opposite directions, basically. So your, your, pointer and your thumb on your right hand are going into the board, your pointer and your thumb on the other hand are coming out towards you. And that makes a lot more sense when you can see me in person, but that's a good kind of estimate for the shape of a tetrahedral structure is if you make, you know, make an L and a backwards L and put them together, that's going to be about the bond angles of uh, a tetrahedral structure. At least for my hands, I guess if your hands aren't, aren't as flexible or are more flexible, then you could probably mess with those bond angles, but um, then we also have other sort, this other one is basically only used for these bicyclic compounds. We'll get more practice with that. There's going to be a class of reactions that make bicyclic products. And so we'll get more practice drawing this when we get to that, but that's not for another quarter at least. Let's see. <coughs> Mind if I uh, interject real quick? Yeah, please. Aren't uh, bicyclic compounds typically like opioid type medications? If they're a medication at all. Ah. Um, although cocaine might be bicyclic. Yeah, I think nicotine might be as well. Um, so it, it really just depends on what of the different binding sites. So yeah, so there's that bicyclic structure um, of, of cocaine. Um, morphine is going to be an even larger, so it's an even more complicated structure. You've got a bicyclic structure, at least one bicyc. that's like two bicyclic structures fused together. Very um, complex molecule, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the reasons why, why opiates tend to to affect a lot of different processes because there's a lot of different binding sites that that could interact with if you look at different parts of the molecule. Sean, are you meaning to be on screen share right now? Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> 
sorry that so there's morphine super complicated structure where you have there's a fused bicyclic structure where you have two six-sided rings that are fused together also fused to these other structures um and then cocaine was a simpler bicyclic structure that looks a lot more like we were, what we were just talking about. If we look at the 2D view of these, we wind up with this weird looking thing where it looks like all the bond angles are, you know, being being stretched out on the rack. Um, if you, if among organic chemists, especially those of us who teach organic chemistry, um, we refer to uh, to structures that are drawn where the bond angles look like they really don't match what they should be. Um, we call those tortured carbons um, because they're being like stretched in ways that they're not supposed to be. Um, as you guys get better at drawing structures, you will draw fewer tortured carbons, but sometimes there's no better way around it um, in the case of really complicated molecules. All right, so I, I just mainly wanted you to see and get used to the dots and the wedges because those are going to be the most common way that we're going to show 3D structure, um, especially for me as I'm drawing on the board. When I'm drawing a tetrahedral structure, I'm always going to try and draw it two bonds in the plane of the board. And then in the third direction is going to be a bond out and a bond in. Is um, That's the easiest way, the most consistent way to draw a tetrahedral structure if you're trying to, to show all four bonds. Let's, so a quick review of where we went with molecular orbitals. Um, so molecular orbitals were basically um, the fact that if you have atomic orbitals that are close enough to each other and can overlap in some of the same space, they wind up making this new shape that's sort of the mixture of the other two shapes. Um, it's so a, a 1s orbital from a hydrogen and the um, a p orbital from the oxygen wind up adding up to make this um, sigma bond shape. Um, and this is partly as a result of that Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which was that basically we can ignore the fact that nuclei move when we're talking about organic chemistry because they move so slowly compared to the electrons. Electrons move so much more quickly um, than the nuclei that we can basically say that the, the nuclei aren't moving at all. And so when we're drawing, doing things like drawing mechanisms or resonance structures, anytime we're going to be drawing things moving around, we're always going to be showing where the electrons are moving, not where the nuclei are moving. The nuclei will slowly be pulled into, the, into place, into a new shape, after the electrons already move into that shape. Right, so um, when we're drawing these arrows that we're going to practice later today, the arrows, the mechanism arrows in OCHEM, um, which are different than reaction arrows, reaction arrows and equilibrium arrows are always going to be drawn as just straight lines. Anytime you see a curved arrow in organic chemistry, we're showing where the electrons are moving. We're showing a mechanism um, and the sort of the pathway that leads between the two different shapes. Um, and so one of the ways that we can we can see this is if we have something that looks a structure that looks like this where we have an alkene next to an alcohol. Um, this is actually a, a sub class of functional groups. It's not very common. Um, that's actually called an enol. Um, so kind of what you would expect, alkene plus OL for alcohol, and enol will actually spontaneously rearrange itself to make a ketone or an aldehyde. And the way it does that is because these electrons can move back and forth so quickly, um, we can show that by drawing some of these mechanism arrows. And this isn't one that I would expect you to come up with on your own at this point. We'll get there. Um, but if we draw this with everything drawn out, and show our lone pairs here on the oxygen, basically what's going to happen when we do this is we're going to just move the electrons around 
in a way that doesn't break any um, any of our rules for valences. Um, and is that is that zoomed in enough? Can you guys see that where I'm drawing? Okay. Um, so we we have to make sure when we draw these arrows, we don't break our rules for number of electrons. So we can't draw um, any any arrows that are saying electrons are moving in a way that's going to give a carbon 10 electrons. But if we can, if we're careful about how we draw this, if we say, okay, it's going to be more stable or it's, it's possible for this oxygen to turn into a carbon oxygen double bond by drawing a curved arrow from the electrons moving towards a nucleus, because electrons are always going to be drawn towards a positive charge like a nucleus. But we can't just leave it there because then that carbon would have 10 electrons. And so what happens instead is this pair of electrons actually moves up and grabs the hydrogen from the oxygen. But then that would leave this, this oxygen is then going to wind up with, again, carbon oxygen pi bond. We're going to move these electrons to the carbon to make carbon oxygen pi bonds. This pair of electrons is not going to go with the hydrogen. It's going to stay with the oxygen because oxygen is more electronegative. And if we follow the result of all three of those arrows that are all going to happen simultaneously, what you, what you, get is this carbon gains a hydrogen because it took the pi electrons and made a new bond here. This carbon had a pi bond to the other carbon and now it has a pi bond to the oxygen. And this oxygen still has two lone pairs. So this is just as an example of a way we would show electrons moving and not show the, the uh, nuclei moving, and I'll go back and show you the um, original reaction that this was from. It was moving from this um, from this enol structure, this alcohol next to an alkene, and it will spontaneously rearrange to add the hydrogen to the um, carbon over here. By and it just moves these electrons in this structure. So. This is sort of the, where they were and their understanding of how organic reactions happened um, in the mid to late 1800s. They knew that electrons, they didn't understand molecular orbitals or anything, but they knew how lone pairs worked to some extent. Um, and they knew that if you, if you had lone pairs, you could draw these mechanisms that showed the lone pairs and the electrons moving to represent and to, to understand how some reactions happened. But this, it really played a, or it, it really caused a problem when they looked at benzene. So in the mid 1800s, they didn't know what benzene was. They knew it existed. They knew its molecular formula was C6H6, and they knew it was really, really stable. Um, they knew it was really, really stable because they could look at other other compounds that had similar formulas, and they could and they were all really, really reactive. So like C C8H8 is a very reactive molecule. So reactive, they had a hard time actually isolating it. And C6H, C6H8, so benzene with two extra hydrogens added, was a very reactive molecule. But benzene, C6H6, didn't go through any of the same reactions that these, other, that these others went through. Um, and so they knew it was really stable for some reason. And they knew that when you did a substitution on it, if you pulled off a hydrogen and replaced it with a chlorine or a bromine, it only made one product. We'll talk about ways to separate different products um, in lab today. Um, but they were able to do a substitution and it realized it only came up with one possible product, which means either all of the carbons are the same or that there's one carbon that's going to, they're going to do these substitutions at preferentially. 
So they they tried continuing on with that. And rather than drawing the structure, I'm going to go walk you through the logic, which is how they got to the structure of benzene. Um, the idea that so one substitution leads to one, only one product means that you sh there's either all of the carbons are the same or one of the carbons is easier to do a substitution on than the others. But then they found out if they did a second substitution, it gave them three different products, which doesn't work with the one carbon is easier to substitute logic. Because if one carbon is easier to substitute, then the second substitution should also be on that same carbon. And you should, again, get one or at most two products. The fact that a second substitution gave you three different products that they could separate out even with the technology they had told us that there was something weird going on. And so that's actually what Kukule, um, what he basically contributed to organic chemistry was he drew a structure that matched the molecular formula of benzene that fit these criteria. He, he said that benzene is really actually two isomers. So where you have a cyclo, Hex, hexyl group, a okay, so six-sided ring structure with alternating double bonds. And if you count up all of the bonds on each of those carbons, each of those carbons has one hydrogen. And what that, that allows you to do is if you replace, if you replace a hydrogen on one of these carbons, say we replace a hydrogen there with a with a chlorine, um, this carbon is actually structurally identical to any of the other carbons here. You can't tell the difference between that carbon and this other carbon. So that actually fits the criteria for a single substitution only gives you one product. And then that means if you do another substitution, there are actually three distinct places you can put it. You can put it adjacent to the first substitution, one carbon away from the first substitution, or opposite of the first substitution. So this actually met all the criteria. Um, and so he was, he was the first one to actually be able to describe that structure of benzene, although he still couldn't explain why it was so stable. Um, and this is actually, I think I, I mentioned one in the first lecture talking about um, the Ouroboros, the serpent that's devouring its own tail. That's the dream that he had supposedly where he thought of this was he was thinking about these electrons chasing each other in a circle. So like the snake devouring its own tail is having this rapid equilibrium where these electrons are shifting from one carbon to the next carbon to the next carbon in this sort of perpetual circular motion like the Ouroboros. Um, but he still wasn't able to, to describe why benzene doesn't go through other reactions that alkenes do. If benzene is just a bunch, a tri-alkene, how come it doesn't react like other alkenes? What is it about benzene that makes it more stable compared to any other alkene? And the answer was, it's because of the resonance, because of the ability to spread the electrons out and the fact that they can shift between carbons and have this big spread out space makes them more stable. So let's go ahead and take our break there. Let's come back at five after and we'll practice drawing resonance structures and talking about hybridization some more. Hey, thanks for uh, sending over that link to the uh, Metasynthesis website. I found yeah, that one no I was looking for. Yeah, it's, it looks a little different now, um, but I think it's still got all the same stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it took me a little bit of searching to try to find it. It definitely does have a different layout, different kind of format, but yeah, it, everything was still there. Good. Be hey, curious to see. Good. Uh, I'm sorry, could are you saying something? Uh, yeah, but I think I forgot what I was going to say. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, hey, Sean, so when, um, and the drawing behind you, when all of the, like, electrons shifted, what exactly would make that, like, occur? Like, just form more favorable bonds? Is like, a chemical reaction? Like, what in that environment would cause that to happen? 
you had it right when you said forming more favorable bonds. Um, it basically it is. Okay, is, yeah, this is uh, an equilibrium reaction. And remember from, from Gen Chem that okay. we can basically treat every reaction like an equilibrium reaction. It's just which side is favored, mm -hmm. right? And so in this case, it's actually favorable yeah. to make the carbon oxygen pi bond. And so if you have that, it'll, it'll shift. And depending on what the molecule actually looks like, it'll be like a 30 to one ratio where it favors making the carbon oxygen okay. pi bond. But some small percentage of the time, it'll actually exist as that other structure. Okay. And a pi bond is just a double bond, right? Yeah, so remember that, that the sigma bonds are those single bonds where you had that direct orbital overlap where they could line up right on top of each other. And then the pi bonds, they had to be above and below the other atoms because okay. you can't have two sets of electrons in the same space. So they had that shape that looked like two p orbitals overlapping with each other. Yeah, because it's, it's really just like an energy cloud. It's like what we're looking at, but we're just looking at like a 2D imprint of an energy cloud. Um, exactly. And then I have one more question. So yeah. when you're showing like the images of like the morphine and like the other drugs and stuff. So like in our brains, do we have individual sites that actually like receive those or do they like somehow come in and get synthesized like down into our brains, but we actually have like, because we learned about that anatomy like a little bit, but it wasn't like we didn't learn about large scale molecules like that so much. It's, so it's going to be similar with the larger molecules. Um, it's and there, you know, you'll actually hear people in, in, in news stories, science news stories, you'll actually hear about um, some treatments for opioid addiction or things, are medications that block the opiates from, from binding to certain, and they actually will refer to certain opioid sites, opioid mm -hmm. binding sites. And so like Narcan is the one they do for overdoses. And it basically yeah. prevents the opiate from blocking to, to certain sites on the brain stem that would shut down the body. Okay, I guess that makes sense because I guess it's just like I'm thinking of like a sodium potassium like pump. And, you know, that's just obviously really simple because it's just sodium potassium coming in and out of the cell. But like it's just kind of interesting to think that we actually have like larger scale ones that'll just like take the whole like morphine molecule like into the brain. Yeah, and it gets even bigger than that because insulin yeah. is a is a tiny protein, right? That's a, I say tiny, but it's like 126 amino acids long. Mm -hmm. And in insulin, we have certain binding sites in all over our body that specifically respond to insulin. So you can actually have almost an entire protein coming in and docking with a second protein, which changes the structure of both of them in a way that it alters the function. Um, so the, the protein, yeah, the, the potassium sodium pumps and like the real small molecules um, are a good way of understanding how that works, getting it to understand it a little bit, but it, it operates on a much larger scale as well. Yeah. Do you have like a good video, like a good source I could like look into that? Because I think that's like really interesting. Like I kind of want to see it like almost like drawn out a little bit to like fully like grasp what that does. Let, I feel me, like I'm, let think me about think it. about that where, what would be, because there's a couple good examples like hemoglobin is really well understood. Um, but mm -hmm. it's a little bit big and it's still small molecules, but there's some really good figures, 3D videos of the hemoglobin changing shape um, based on whether or not there's, um, based on the pH, for instance, pH will change the shape of hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. um, to the, and that's actually how, your, how your, your hemoglobin, quote unquote, knows to let go of the oxygen. Yeah. Is that the, in your extremities, when you're using lots of, of, sugar and producing lots of CO2, CO2 dissolved in water is, makes carbonic acid, right? Mm -hmm. um, which means that when you're burning lots of sugar and don't have much oxygen around, your blood will be slightly more acidic. And it's just a big enough difference in acidity that um, the hemoglobin that bonds really well to oxygen in your lungs changes shape enough and basically can't hold on to the oxygen as tightly when it gets to a more acidic environment. So okay. it's, it's almost designed so that once it gets to the area that has the greatest need for oxygen, it's most likely to let go of the oxygen yeah. because of that, that change in pH. Um, and it's and a real subtle change in the shape though. Okay. And when we're saying the blood becomes more acidic, would that be like through, um, like the anaerobic process where it's like forming lactic acid, is that what causes it to be more like acidic or is it just kind of like an overall health like diet thing? Um, it's, so it's, it's on a, not on the scale, the time scale of, 
diet and nutrition having anything to do with it. It's just if you're burning more sugar, whether it's anaerobic or aerobic, mm-hmm. um, you're going to be producing more CO2. Yeah. If you're producing more CO2, that makes the blood more acidic because CO2 itself will make the blood more acidic. So lactic acid will speed that process up. Okay. Um, and so that might be why if you're using part of your body aerobically and part of your body anaerobically, it's going to be even more likely to drop it off in the anaerobic areas and try and get to that back to being aerobic. Yeah. Because there, those areas, will, the pH will change faster because you're making something directly acidic as opposed to making CO2, which is mildly acidic. Yeah. Okay. That makes Okay. Um, but yeah, let me think about of what would be a good, see if I can think of a good video that has the shape there. Um, because it is really cool to see these proteins change shape in real life or in, yeah. in real time. You know, yeah, like, like a nicer, like little diagram that makes more sense of it. Cause that's, that's actually very helpful to make me learn. And it'll be very helpful for my major as well. Yeah. That's the fun stuff. That's why we study OCHEM. Right, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'll be back. Like your uh, choice for the lab project today, man. That looks very interesting. Um, I was going to try and make our own video. Me and Mariella were going to get in the lab and make a video of this, but this um, this guy who makes these videos is really, really um, good at explaining things and making visuals. Um, the production value is, is way higher when he does it compared to um, if I was going to do it myself. So I thought, why why reinvent the wheel? It's already been done. If he's got a really good video for it. Um, so we'll see. We'll see yeah, how it goes. I haven't checked out the video, but it seems like the scope of the material that you're covering is very interesting. Oh, okay. good. Yeah, it's um, it's going to be really common. That That's sort of the basis for almost every OCHEM lab is you do a reaction, and then you have to purify your product. And so we're going to go over a bunch of the purification steps today. Um, and then we'll probably add a few. We'll, we'll probably spend a whole lecture on distillation either next week or the week after. Um, because distillation, one, there's some interesting math you can do with distillation. And we can bring Excel in and have Excel model some stuff pretty well. Pretty, um, pretty well. Um, but I might save that lab for later on and just do some basic distillations but yeah we're gonna we're gonna i'm gonna keep trying to make it relevant make it so that you couldn't just replace this class by watching a youtube channel um, but at the same time some of those youtube channels are really good <laughs> the bar set pretty high man but i like what you did hey, sean, sean i got a question for you about the lab yeah. um with technology being how good it is now like with some of the stuff that happens in the lab can you essentially just simulate it the same way? I mean, obviously, I know you're not doing the lab procedures, but some of the stuff that you get are there, or some of the labs that we do, are there programs or simulations that we would put in what were like kind of just the variables and then it would almost solve it for you? I mean, we can do something like that. And I've, I've thought about, I've done labs before where I basically, you know, said, we're going to pretend like we're going to do this. And I'm just going to give you made up data that for what I know should happen. Um, and so it'd be, you know, and I don't know what you guys did last year for radioactivity, but a lot of times that's what we'll do for a radioactivity lab will be something like, we're going to set this up and pretend like this is a radioactive sample and that this is a Geiger counter. And I'm going to give you an Excel sheet full of made up data. Um, but a lot of these, these modern instruments, um, they actually just output things in a spreadsheet form in a 